Water. It's a commodity we seem to have an endless amount of here in the developed world, cheap and flowing whenever we turn on the tap. But what if I told you that we'll run out of fresh, drinkable water within the coming decades? Now, that would sound absurd, wouldn't it? Well, I never thought we would ever run out of fresh water. And this meant my mum constantly banged at the door as I took a long and hot shower. I bet something you can relate. Well, my mum was right. But you see, it goes far beyond anything I could have understood at the time. Water is a right. Water is a commodity. And water is life. Water is such a valuable resource that we only last a few days without it. But how often do we stop and think about where it comes from? Early civilization was built around water. Those who were able to harness it thrived and those who failed fell. In 1970, the United States Environmental Protection Agency found that a mere 1% of the Earth's water is fresh and usable. Within that 1% of fresh usable water, 70% of it is tucked away in underground reservoirs known as aquifers. Aquifers take tens of thousands of years to build up and relies on rainwater to seep deep underground, which makes this water extremely slow and costly to extract, which is why it only makes up 30% of our water supply. 69% comes from surface water, such as rivers, and 1% comes from desalination. Now, I'll touch upon desalination later, but I'd like to continue with a story I was told while visiting my family in India. We were on our way to a shopping mall via auto rickshaw. As usual, my mum would ask the driver how his wife and kids were doing, but for once, the driver's response actually surprised me. His name was Rajesh. He came from a crowded, low-income area of New Delhi, the capital city. He had two children under the ages of 10. Baths for the family were out of the question as every drop counts in an area like this. His wife would wake up early in the morning and spend hours queuing at the community tap. Could you imagine doing that? Delhi's situation is not alone and is getting ever worse due to multiple factors such as urbanization, a lack of regulation, contamination of rivers via industrial processes, and agricultural use of pesticides and fertilizer. Additionally, there's an over-extraction of aquifers, which makes up 80% of the domestic supply in India, which is completely unsustainable. Now, everyone here in this room is exceptionally fortunate, but I don't want you to think this is a problem just experienced by those in poverty, as it has a much more direct impact than you may think. The fact that a virtually unlimited amount of water is provided to us at a low cost means that most people don't think it's an issue, but cities such as Beijing, Istanbul, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, and even us here in London are set to run out of water within the coming decades, unless some radical changes are made. An article by Morgan Stanley last year predicted that by 2030, fresh water demand will outstrip supply by 40%. That's a concerning statistic. In 2018, Cape Town was the first major city that planned to shut off its water supply to 4 million people. It was labelled as day zero. Both government intervention and awareness spread by the media meant that Cape Town's water consumption had more than halved within four years, which just goes to show how we value water when it begins to run out. The efforts in Cape Town stopped any plans to turn off the water, but is Cape Town's day zero a glimpse into our future? And are we ready to face the consequences of it? One of the key issues is how we use the available water given to us, as only three to 8% of our consumption is for domestic purposes. About 70% goes towards agriculture. Water is cheap, so it doesn't make economic sense for farmers to use it sparingly when growing crops or livestock. The rest of water consumption goes towards industrial uses, which can also be reduced and is very polluting. This is especially bad in developing countries where water often goes untreated and regulation to conserve it isn't considered much, allowing businesses to do what they like. Now, for everyone to understand how much water goes into producing some of the products we all consume, I'll give you some examples. 
the average human is expected to drink three and a half litres of water per day. A cup of coffee takes 140 litres to produce. This makes sense when you consider all the processes it goes through from a seedling. An apple takes 125 litres. An avocado takes 280. A single cotton t-shirt takes 2,200 litres of water. But nothing, absolutely nothing, takes more water than meat. With a single kilogram of beef taking 15,500 litres of water. Cattle typically must be fed for five years, which is why this number is so high. This is also how we get burgers in fast food restaurants just for a few pounds. The water cost is not reflected in the price. One of the key issues is that if the price of water were to significantly increase, this will be reflected in all of our consumed goods and we would see a massive inflation spike that no interest rates will be able to fix. This means it's politically popular to push any action back. Climate change is increasingly starting to have an impact on the distribution of water, making wet places wetter and dry places drier. With climate change increasingly starting to have an impact on our water distribution, can we really count on our traditional water sources to remain reliable? We value water so little that we dump almost 2 million tonnes of untreated sewage into it every day. That's according to the UN in 2003 and that number has only got worse over the last two decades. Additionally, the fact that this number has not been revised yet shows a complete lack of care for the issue. Some countries in South America even lose up to 65% of their water through leaky pipes. That isn't just because there's some random developing country either, as here in London, we lose about half of it in the same way. Why do we tolerate the loss of 45 billion litres of water daily through leaky pipes. That's the equivalent to 18,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. With water being so cheap, there's no incentive to fix these pipes. Water is priced as if we'll always have enough of it, so we use it in insanely wasteful ways. If the price of water were to increase, it would be valued more and help instigate change. But water can't abide by the fundamental laws of capitalism. How can we raise the price of something so that it can be valued while also ensuring everyone has access to it? Now, that's a question for future politicians to decide, not a 15-year-old boy, but we could, for example, have it based off a percentage of income or have a certain amount of it at a low cost and if you go above a certain threshold, it'll have a significant cost. Water is playing an increasingly more relevant role in violent conflicts making wet places wetter and dry places drier, with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people losing their lives. Some analysts even claim that a drought in 2006 played a significant role in the Syrian civil war. Currently, these conflicts are confined to the more impoverished nations of the world, but we're already starting to see a spread with countries such as India and China already having border disputes over the Himalayan mountain range. Even banks, which are driven by profit, are starting to understand this resources investment opportunity, with the bank Goldman Sachs predicting that water will become the petroleum of the mid-21st century. The private sector is increasingly starting to be interested in water, to exploit scarcity, to turn a profit. Now, coming back to desalination, I'm pleased to tell you it's a viable solution but just not yet. You see, desalination is incredibly energy intensive, making our transition to a net zero grid very expensive, and it's just much cheaper to fix all those leaky pipes. Desalination will need to make some significant innovative breakthroughs to become something we can use today, but I don't see it becoming a major source of our water over the next coming decades. So, as I wrap up today, Ask yourself this, is it right for us to take our water supply for granted as we do the air we breathe? Thank you.